sweet Holy Spirit, we ask that you come today and be with us. That you will anoint this message with power. And yet, may the power be mingled with grace and compassion and love. That's my Lord. So, Lord, be with these words. We pray, Father, that for someone viewing in today that doesn't know who you are, that's heard about you but doesn't know you, may they meet you today. May they make you their personal Savior today. Guide this message, Heavenly Father. Direct me, strengthen me, and encourage me as I send these words out across the air, through the media, around the world. If just one person is saved because of this message, Lord, it's been worth the work. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of preaching Christ to your people. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. I want to welcome those that are viewing in today. Uh, so happy that you took the time to spend some time with us here at the Touching Hearts Ministries Church, located just a few miles west of Mount Vernon here in southern Illinois. We would love to hear from you, either by phone or text or email. We would love to hear from you and get your take on some of these sermons that we've been putting on the air that's going across the world even as we speak. So thank you for, and I pray that you will take the time to get a pencil and pad today and write these scriptures down after we go off the air. Maybe you might want to study them for yourselves to find yourself approved. And is Pastor Donnie Shelton, is he on the mark? I want you to write these down and study them this week. Anyway, everybody in our church today, welcome. Thank you for coming to our church because those that are viewing in, we have a many, many different churches in our area that these precious folks could have went today. But they decided to come to Touching Hearts Ministries and we are so so thankful and we would ask that the church get your bibles out today and we're going to turn to a scripture that you've heard over and over and over but today we're going to dissect this scripture and i think that you're going to get a twofold message today anyway let's go to genesis 3 8 genesis third chapter verse 8 and here's what the bible says and they heard the voice of the lord we're talking about adam and eve here and they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day in the evening. And here's what Adam and Eve did. Now listen. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. Now I wrote this down because I didn't want to forget this today, Bob. Here. God has been communicating with human beings ever since he created Adam and Eve. God has communicated with us through angels the Holy Spirit through prophets and everybody said amen all through scripture God used prophets and these prophets different ones take Isaiah they prophesied that Jesus was coming they prophesied that there was a plan of salvation if you go to Isaiah 53 in fact we're going to go there today we're going to talk about that as well it these different prophets prophesied of the soon coming of Jesus the plan of salvation and let's go a little bit further. For I, I don't want to give the message away this early. God provided everything possible for our first parents. Who was our first parents? Adam and Eve. He planted a garden already in full bloom even before Adam and Eve were created. Listen, the first couple did not have to scratch out an existence or suffer trial and error in order to survive. Adam and Eve lived in a perfect world wouldn't you like to live in a perfect world adam and eve lived in a perfect world and here's what god did for adam and eve today nothing was left out in their comfort the luscious kinds of plants for food the joy of work listen a dazzling flower and garden show daily for adam and eve no rain no rust no corruption, and perfect companionship with each other and with God. And everybody said amen. Imagine this, those that are viewing in. A husband and wife had perfect companionship. <laughs> My wife and I just celebrated, in fact, Bob and Lenny as well, yesterday. We celebrated our 33rd anniversary. In society today, if people can make it 33 days, everybody shouts victory. 
33 years. But in Adam and Eve's case, they had perfect companionship and had the opportunity every evening. The Bible says, not what Pastor Donnie Shelton says, the Bible says that Jesus, the creator of all things, came and visited with Adam and Eve and they walked hand in hand in the garden. Everybody said, Amen. Now, let me read this to you, though. But the unthinkable, the unimaginable, especially in the environment in which Adam and Eve lived, listen, the unraveling of mankind, the most horrendous and damaging mistake that has ever been committed on this planet, this mistake led to a world gone mad. The decision that Adam and Eve made to partake of the fruit tree that God said don't even touch it was the biggest mistake in all of mankind. And everybody's got to agree with me on there. But today they have a twofold message. Adam and Eve sinned, but God had a plan. There was not a plan A and B. God had an A plan. Come on. Amen. They made a mistake they made a decision. What I'm saying is today in your everyday life, you make one wrong decision, it could change your life forever. One wrong decision can change your life forever. And that's why the Bible says to pray without ceasing and in everything pray and give thanks. One wrong decision. Now listen to this. Many times in chapter 3, we've read this chapter over and over. Now, there was much more going on, listen to this, than a conversation between a snake and a woman. Man's fate, man's destination, man's character, and man's life as he had known it was put in the balance. And although the woman was unaware, the devil was about to transform this planet into one of chaos. You would think, now I want you to think about this. I've talked to many, many people across the country. They feel so confident in their relationship with God. They seem so secure and steadfast. They feel there's no way that they could ever fail God. Now, that's a dangerous concept. Think about this. Eve walked with Jesus every evening. She held his hand. She looked into his eyes. They may have supped together in the fruit of the garden. And yet, knowing him on this personal basis, when the devil spoke to her, she began to doubt Jesus and the Father. Can somebody be with me here on this? We need to be in continual prayer without ceasing and study of the Word of God constantly, lest the devil come and persuade us. Is everybody with me so far? Here's what was going on. The serpent said, yes, yea. And God did say, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God said, don't eat it, don't touch it, or you will die. And the devil said, you will not die. Come on. Calling God a liar. You know, <laughs> he tried to break down God's character in heaven and the same plan he had in heaven he took to the earth. Now, let's go a little bit further here. If Eve could have sensed the rage, the jealousy, the bitterness beneath the surface and the voice and the intentions of the devil who was speaking to her, she, he was so fluid at lying. He was so deceptive that his anger and his jealousy and his hate for mankind were covered up. Is everybody with me? Let's go a little bit further. He said, you shall not surely die. This statement was a lie. This, now here's why he said it. The devil was trying to arouse doubt. The devil was saying, I personally, now listen, I, will, I personally will be held responsible if you do die, but have confidence in me, I say you won't die. Come on. Let's go a bit further. He said, trust in me. 
Believe in me. You will not die. God's words are untruthful. You must never put your trust in God. And that is the same concept of the world today. 99 and a half percent of the world today do not put their trust in God. Can somebody, if you don't have trust in God, you're putting your trust in the devil today. There's only two sides to take today. Now, we're going to talk about those two sides here very shortly. And here's what else. Listen, the devil said to Eve, your eyes will be opened. And this statement is partially true, Robbie Dean. They were opened. They were open, mixing truth with air is Satan's specialty. He has had much practice. Not only the practice in heaven, but 6,000 years of deception and lying. You must get pretty good at it. Come on, somebody. When the Bible says, keep the Ten Commandment law, if you offend in one in keeping the Ten Commandment law, you have offended in all. Is everybody with me? But the devil is so deceptive, he says, hey, to the world, what difference does it make which day you keep? Is everybody with me? As long as you honor God, it doesn't make a difference. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Keeping the Ten Commandment law is still in effect. Now, all right, we're going to get into that in just a minute here, too. Now, listen. The woman, as she spoke with the devil, she began to doubt God and His Word. But let us remember this. Now, here's what I want you to remember. The transgression that she committed, even before tasting the fruit, had taken place. Thou shalt not covet. She was lusting for that fruit. She hadn't tasted it, but boy, did she want it. She had already committed sin before she tasted the fruit. Are you with me? That's why the Bible says, men and women, if you look upon another woman or man in lust, you've already committed sin. The transgression is Is anybody with me? That's why we have to be spiritually and physically and mentally and emotionally sound based upon what the Bible says. Come on. Now, let's go a bit further here. Boy, it's awful quiet in here today, Brenda. All right, let's go a bit further. Genesis 3, 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. Already, she said, I want this fruit. She coveted the fruit. Now listen. She stole God's property when she ate the fruit. That was God's tree. <laughs> Come on now. So she coveted, and then she became a thief. Let's go a little bit further. I'm not done yet. Let's go on. The transgression took place before she tasted the fruit. Now, she transgressed the sixth commandment because when she gave the fruit to Adam, she literally murdered him. Come on. That fruit became a weapon. It became poison. She coveted, she stole, and she committed murder. When you step out and make the wrong decision, it has a way of snowballing. Come on. You think you're going to do something in secret, and no one finds out, and the next thing you know, they do find out. For instance, this week on the Internet, it was talking about a high school principal. Now, they make pretty good money. He had a great position in society. He was married. He had children. He was looked up to. He was honored in the community. And he had an affair with a 17-year-old girl. He goes to prison now. He loses his wife, his family, his job, and his respect from society by one wrong decision. Is everybody with me today? One wrong decision, Robbie, can change your life forever. Let's go a little bit further here. Take heed, brethren, in Hebrews 3.12. The, listen, the seed of the woman, lest there be any evil, listen, heart of unbelief within you in departing from the living God, stand on His promises and stand on His word. Now, listen to this. At the conclusion of the, listen, at the conclusion of the discussion with the devil, a decision was made, Jan. It was not based upon the Word of God. Every decision you make in life, Ben, if it's based upon the Word of God, you can't go wrong. 
You may, you may suffer for it, but you can't go wrong. Amen? Every decision must be based upon the Word of God. Eve's decision was not based upon the Word of God, but selfish desires. And because of this, sin was born into a perfect world. And because of sin, then came strife. Then came deceit. Then came murder. Then came hate and bitterness and guilt and grief. And then death. Romans 6.23 says what? The wages of sin is what? Because they sinned, living in a perfect world, death was announced that it would take place in every human being that ever walked this planet because of one sin. Can everybody give me an amen? We need to stay together on this. You need to make the decision today, I'm going to keep my eyeballs on the Word of God. Not once a week. <laughs> oh, I studied Wednesday night for 15 minutes. Come on, somebody help me. Constantly in the Word of God. Now, so Hebrews said, Paul said, Take heed, brother, lest you start to have a lack of faith in God by listening to what the world has to say. The devil is the mouthpiece of the world's thoughts today. He's the mouthpiece behind it all. Now, let's go a little further. The truth of the Scripture. Listen, you may have worked your entire life to build respectability. You may have worked your entire life, Bobby Joe, to own land, diverse properties, and through honest work and honest transactions, you have built a solid reputation as an asset to society. Any decision that is not based upon the Word of God is up for grabs. And the devil has big hands. He has long and strong arms. Listen, and he will lay hold on everything that you have by one wrong decision that's not based upon the Word of God. No one, that's why we preach here, no one has a right to mess with God's Ten Commandment law. You change anything, you are making the decision, I am putting myself above God, and I'm going to change this commandment or that commandment. Is anybody with me? That's why we stand strong here, with long as we live by the principles of God, based upon the Word of God and His Ten Commandment law, and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the walk that we're supposed to walk for Jesus Christ. Can somebody give an amen on that? Now, he said here, Paul did in Hebrews 3.12, he said, take heed. You know what that means? Beware. <laughs> Consider. Be careful. Listen, a heart, an evil heart of unbelief, in the core of all who profess to be followers of Christ, we need full confidence and belief in Jesus. That is paramount in your walk with God. There should never be a doubt in anyone to a God that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And everybody said, Amen. We need to have full even if I don't understand, Ben, why? We said a few weeks ago, thank God, in heaven, there won't be any whys. Why, why, why? We're going to know. We're going to understand. God give us new eyes, a new brain to think with a spiritual brain. We will, there'll be no questioning God. Why did this happen? We won't have time for that. We're going to be flying to different worlds. Come on. Won't have time for it. Here's what Proverbs 3, 5 says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not upon your own understanding. What did I say to say? You won't. There's been things happening in my life. I keep saying, why? Why? I try to figure those. I won't be able to figure those things out. So here's what the Bible says right here. Don't lean upon your own understanding. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. What does fear mean? Am I supposed to be terrified of God, CJ? No. It means to respect the Lord. Show reverence unto God. Trust in Him. 
love in him, rely upon him. And here's what the Bible says. Run away from all appearance of evil. Run. <laughs> Stay away from it. If it approaches you, run. Eve should have ran. Now, the spirit of prophecy, another prophet we talked about, she says that Adam knew full well what Eve had done. He knew it. But he, he tasted of the fruit because he could not bear living a life without Eve. But he knew better. Wow. And the Bible says here, and the eyes of them were opened and they knew they were naked. Listen, it appeared... Listen, that Eve, after living in the presence with Jesus, walking and talking with Him daily, holding His hand, singing with Jesus Christ every it would appear she would never doubt His word, His promises, or His conditions, but she did. Unbelief entered her. She was swayed. She was hoodwinked. She was tricked by the liar Satan. So what we're saying today is beware. Be careful. Don't get that confident. I got it now. <laughs> or, don't. I, I'm saved already no matter what happens. I'll be in the kingdom. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Every day is a walk with Jesus Christ. Every day that I live, Robert Dean, listen, will determine my eternal salvation. It doesn't matter what I did yesterday. You know, all the places I've been to preach, it doesn't matter where I've been to preach. My, listen, my destination depends on what I do today. How I react today. What I think today. What are my motives today? Am I still in the word of God today? And everybody said, Amen. Now, they opened their eyes and they knew they were naked. They realized they were no longer innocent. They could see that they were naked. And here's what they did. Pitiful. They made some fig leaf aprons to cover themselves. Because, here's what the Bible says, the radiant garments of innocence had vanished and the guilt of what they had done drove them to hide in the garden here's what sin does elaine sin separates sin divides sin builds walls between god and his people and the result is adam and eve were no longer able to look into the eyes of jesus they were no longer able to walk in the garden with him mankind would be forever separated from god but God had a plan. <laughs> the devil actually thought, if I get Eve to sin, I win. <laughs> the battle had just begun. <laughs> Amen. It had just begun. Let's go a bit further. A ter now, here's what happened. A terrible change took place when Adam and Eve sinned. They could no longer see or speak with God face to face. <laughs> Not because God had changed, but the couple had changed. Sin had reconfigured their minds and their heart. They now had a carnal nature. Is everybody with me? Adam and Eve were created perfect. They were perfect. Their speech, their actions, their reactions, their habits, their thoughts, their motives all changed. When carnality of the heart and mind and soul reconfigured their character. That's why one little light white sin will lead to another and another. And every sin breaks down the character of God. And every sin that you commit separates you further from the God that I serve. It's so important. Every little decision that I make could change my life forever. We're going to say that over and over again today. Now, how do you know that they change? Well, first of all, they went to hide. You live out in the world long enough, you start hiding from God. You want nothing to do with Him. Nothing. You don't want to hear anybody talk about God. The more that you sin and live out in the world. Now, listen to this. This is what the Bible says. Knowing it was the time of the day which Jesus would arrive, listen, for every evening, the Bible says, the Lord would come and spend one-on-one -on -one time with Adam and Eve, but something terrible had transpired. Sin had entered the world, and the life that Adam and Eve had known was over. 
This is what sin does, CJ and Doug. Sin blinds the mind to all the things of God. It benumbs the mind to the consequences of sin. Sin, abnormal, becomes normal. In our world today, it's normal thinking for a woman to marry a woman. The abnormal has become normal. Can somebody help me? Sin feeds enmity. Sin feeds bitterness and hostility and hatred. Sin feeds your worst enemy, carnality. The end result of sin, here's what the Bible says, Romans 6, 23, for the end of sin is death, for the wages of sin is death. And here's what it says in Isaiah 59, 2. I almost overlooked this one, Robbie. Your iniquities have separated you from God and your sins have hid your face from you and you from him. Come on. That's what sin does. Yet man was created, the Bible says, with a perfect nature, and he was in complete harmony with God. And I'm going to read this to you. Just think. Every evening, Jesus could be found walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. Now listen. Jesus, the creator of all things, smelling the fragrance of the flowers, and listening with pure interest to the singing of the birds as they flocked around our Creator, knowing that He was the Son of God. Now, if you can just use your imagination for a moment and place yourself in the Garden of Eve as a spectator to the wonderful relationship between Jesus and Adam and Eve, wouldn't you have loved to be a fly on the wall or something, a mosquito, and you watch Jesus sitting in this luscious grass, eating fruit with Adam and Eve, and hear Jesus say, Hey, Eve, how was your day today? Come on. <laughs> Eve, how was, Adam, how was your day today? Can you imagine the laughing and the smiling faces and the singing of the birds and the singing of Jesus and Adam and Eve and what harmony they must have had just break out? And you were watching this, you know what you'd say? Man, someday, if I remain faithful, I'll sit with Jesus. I'll sing with Jesus. And I'll be able to sing Doug Parts when I'm sitting with Jesus. Come on, somebody. In a perfect world without fear and without doubt and the best of all without the devil. Because we're going to come to find out today, Bob, that God had a plan. It looked hopeless. It looked like Adam and Eve were separated from God forever and ever and that this Eden thing, this garden thing would never take place. But God says it will take place again in heaven. And everybody said, amen. Okay, I'm the only one excited today. Now I'm going to get wound up here. Here we go. They were in perfect unity. I would love to live in a family and world that was in perfect unity. I don't see a family out there in perfect unity. Do you? If we'll be honest, in the Shelton family, and there's 9,000 of us in West Frankfurt, there's not perfect unity within the Shelton family. Come on. Lingles, there's not perfect unity. You may have it for a few minutes, and then all heck breaks loose. Come on. Something happens. Last night, we had Lucy and Colt at our home. They spend a lot of time there, don't they, honey? That's our grandbabies. Man, we love them grandbabies. I made the mistake of going to Kroger and buying those little spinner things. It was perfect harmony in our home. Love flowed from every corner of the house. Perfect unity. Kissing and hugging. Poppy, Mama, I love you. I brought their spinners in and a battle, a war broke out over these spinners. Come on. That's what the devil does. He brings in spinners into your life. That's why we have to be aware. Be careful. Is anybody with me so far? Am I the only one? It breaks out. It breaks out in Christian homes too, doesn't it, Doug? Doug, Doug's going to be quiet on that one. I, okay, it does. Bob, it breaks out. You know it does. Now, let's go a bit further now. Don't you yearn for such a time as Adam and Eve had with Jesus? Oh, to hear him say, Jan, Donnie, how was your day? <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But again, God had a plan. He was not taken by surprise at the decision of Eve. He had a plan that would reunite 
that relationship that he had with Adam and Eve in the garden. Listen, but because sin now entered into the hearts and minds of Adam and Eve, God spoke to the serpent, he spoke to the woman, and he spoke to the devil. And when God speaks, the whole universe stands at attention. I don't care how powerful the devil might be. When God says, devil, you get over here and sit down, he sits down. And God spoke to the devil, he spoke to the serpent, and he spoke to Eve as well. And I can tell you something, they listen. Listen to this. In verse 14 and 15, God is talking to Satan and his army of evil angels here. And the Lord said to the serpent, he said to the dragon, he said to Lucifer, he said to the devil, because you have done this thing, Satan, because you've brought sin into the world, listen, because you've done this, talking to the serpent here, you are cursed above the cattle and every beast of the field. Thy belly shall go forth and you will eat dust the rest of your life. And then he turned to the devil. <laughs> this is the favorite part here. I can see the devil like this trembling. I can see it. Now listen. He turned to the devil. And you, Satan, I will put enmity between thee and this woman here. And between thy seed and her seed. And listen, it shall bruise your head, Satan. And it shall bruise his heel. Now we're going to break down today. What are the seeds? What is the woman? What is the enmity we're talking about today? Is everybody with me? Anybody sleep out there? Laying you awake? All right, thank you. He said, I will put enmity. Here, God turns from addressing the little serpent who he spoke to Eve. Listen. And he turns to pronounce judgment on the devil. This was a prediction of the coming of Jesus. He was saying he will bruise your head. In the Greek means he will crush your head. <laughs> Listen. He said he will put imagery between thy seed, Satan, and her seed. Reference is made to the, listen, an age-long struggle between Satan's seed. Who's Satan's seed today? Whoever's following Satan today, that's his seed, Robert Dean. If you don't know Christ, you're Satan's seed today. If you are following Christ, you're part of the church. You're part of the church's seed. And everybody said, amen. A part of the woman's seed. Listen to this. Here's what it says in Acts 13. Paul was addressing a man called Bar-Jesus. He was a sorcerer. He was a false prophet. He was a Jew. And this Jew was seeking to turn away the deputy of this county. To turn him away from Jesus and the faith. And here's what Paul said to this sorcerer. You are full of subtlety and mischief. You are a child of the devil. You are a seed of the devil. Is everybody with me? Thou enemy of righteousness. Thou wilt not cease to pervert the ways of righteousness. This bar Jesus was a seed of the devil. Let me say this one more time. If you are not redeemed, you are not saved, and you're not serving God, you're serving the devil today, and you're part of his seed. And that seed will not be in heaven today. You can tell me you were saved 50 years ago, but here's what a man said the other night, Doug, and I think this pretty well puts everything. Listen. He said, you cannot hold hands with God and walk with the devil. Too many professed Christians are trying to hold hands with God, but they're walking with the devil. It cannot be. Come on, somebody help me. Let's go a bit further now. The followers of the devil are his seed. Those that reject the Ten Commandment law, those that reject Christ as the Son of God, those that live by their carnal nature, and those that love the things of the world more than God, you are the devil's seed today. So we're going to separate who the seed is and are today. In 1 John 3, 7 and 8, here's what the Bible says. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteous is righteous, even as he is righteous through the righteousness of Christ. These are the seed of the woman. These are the followers of Christ. Throughout Scripture, the woman always represents the church. You are seed. 
You're part of the remnant. You're part of the saved. You've been redeemed. You've been washed in the blood. You are the seed of Christ. But he goes on to say, listen here. In verse 8, 1 John. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now you say, oh no, I'm a seed of the devil, I sinned. Well, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. Sad to say, we might sin tomorrow, but that's not our lifestyle. If I do fall short, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to cleanse you from your sin. So we know that there is a possibility that we can, but that's not our lifestyle. Is anybody with me so far? Let me break that down. He is Christ refers to the seed of Christ. Christ is our source. He is our righteousness. His seed constantly abides with him. Of the devil, that means he was saying to bar Jesus, you are a child of the devil. From the beginning, he said, refers to the beginning of the devil's opposition to God. That is, from the beginning of sin in the garden, since then, the devil is constantly sin and is constantly leading us to sin. Once you accept Christ, let me make this a bit more clear. There's a possibility you will sin. But you still abide in Christ. You're not constantly out there sinning, willfully sinning, but we all make mistakes. Come on. We all make mistakes. No one's perfect here. Praise God for the blood of Christ. Listen, Christ in the plan of salvation which was created before man's fall, possibly billions or trillions of years before the fall, Christ was to come to release men from the bondage of sin, the chains of sin, and the result on the sin, and for salvation of mankind. And here's what Revelation 12 says. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. And the angels were cast out with him. And listen to this. Here's the part I want you to get, Jan. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. He was angry with the church. He was angry with the seed of the woman. And he went out to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who are the seed? Those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Can somebody help me? The testimony of Jesus Christ and the faith of Jesus Christ. Donnie, what's the testimony? The testimony are the many, many prophets that God sent throughout Scripture to bring us closer to God and to prophesy of His coming. And they talked about the great plan of salvation. Is everybody with me? In these last days, there are very few prophets, but there is one prophet that I have confidence in. She's written many, many books. One called The Desire of Ages. One called The Steps to Christ. She takes what she understands from what the Bible says through the Holy Spirit and writes many wonderful books, and all of them point to the perfection and the loveliness of God and the plan of salvation and the hope of mankind through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And everybody said amen. Everything that she writes is based upon the Word of God. Is everybody with me? Not conjecturing, not philosophizing, not theorizing. She takes what the Bible says through the power of the Holy Spirit and writes them in the most beautiful, eloquent form that's so easy to understand. And everyone here, give me an amen on that. The woman represents the church, which is the born again. It represents the redeemed and the saved and the seed of Jesus. It represents those who, listen, keep the commandments and love Jesus with all their hearts. These are the ones that put their trust and their hope and their eternal lives in the nail-scarred hands of Christ. And here's what it says in Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children, as Christ's seed, are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death Jesus might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Genesis 3.15, God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. He's talking to Satan here. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and it shall bruise his heel. Whose heel? Jesus. Whose head is he going to crush? The devil's. Now, I'm covering this pretty fast. Blake, i got a lot to say. 
Now listen very carefully. Bruise thy head in the Greek means to crush. The SDA commentary, Bob says, listen, it is evident that crushing the head is far more serious than crushing the heel. If I'm going to get something crushed, I'd rather be my heel than my head. Am I with me? Once the head is crushed, you're dead. You're gone forever. And that's what's going to happen to the devil. Listen. The word seed is singular here. It will not be the seeds or many descendants of the woman that will crush the evil one. It will be a single seed. Who is that? Jesus. One seed shall demolish, disintegrate, annihilate, and terminate, and destroy the kingdom of Satan and his followers. And that is Jesus Christ. Let's go a little bit further with that. God spoke these words in Revelation in reference to the great controversy which began in heaven and continued on earth and ended up in the Garden of Eve. Satan was defeated in heaven and again on this earth. But this battle will end in total, listen, in its totality when Satan's head is crushed. Now, the seed of the woman will be bruised. John 20, 25 says this, The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said, Except I shall see his hands and the prince in his nails and put my finger into the prince of his nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas said, Unless I see Jesus and touch his nail-scarred hands and put my hand through the hole in his side, I will not believe. This is the very one with the nail scars in his hands and the hole in his side that was crucified upon the cross. He is the very one. He is the seed. He is the enmity of Satan that will crush his head. He is the great plan of salvation. He is our only hope. We can only be saved through Jesus Christ today. And one more time, for, just for the record, we cannot be saved through the Pope. Come on. I don't care if he claims to be God on earth. We cannot be. You know why? The Pope is a sinner, just like me. <laughs> He's a sinner. And he will be saved only by God's grace. And everybody said, Amen. All right, let's go a bit further here. Now, here's what it says in Isaiah 53, 5. Jesus Christ is despised and rejected of men. Jesus Christ was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and he was esteemed not. Surely Jesus Christ hath borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. Yet we did not, listen, esteem him, smitten of God and afflicted. But Jesus Christ was wounded for our transgressions. For what Eve did in the garden. Let me throw that in there. Listen, he was wounded because of our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Listen. He bore, he carried our griefs to the cross. It was predicted by a prophet named Isaiah. He carried our griefs to the cross. The sufferings of Jesus and his death. Listen. He suffered for everyone that had sinned upon the face of the earth. And the SDA commentary says that he died in our stead. The pain, the humiliation, he, and the abuse he bore for me. Jesus Christ took what I deserved. He took these things upon himself. The Bible says the chastisement of his peace was on him. The chastisement that he bore in the judgment hall and on the cross was necessary to make peace with God. Why? In Romans 5, 1, the Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Because of Jesus Christ, the judgment hall, the judgment hall experience, carrying the cross to Calvary, being nailed to the cross, the Bible says we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the plan. And everybody said, Amen. Let's go a bit further here. Here's what it says in Hebrews 13:8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ, it says in 
Hebrews 13, 8 in the international version. Jesus, the Messiah, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isaiah 53, 2 says, For he shall grow up before us as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. And it said that Jesus had no form of comeliness. He wasn't handsome. And it says, Every eye that saw him saw no beauty in him or desire to him. Literally, the Bible says, Jesus had no appearance that attracted attention. Man were not attracted to Christ by his beauty, but by his glory. Come on. We will be drawn to Jesus Christ because of his beautiful character. We will be drawn to Christ because of his tenderness. We will be drawn to Christ because of his compassion and his love. There's a song out there, Elaine, that goes like this. It says, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, there's just something about that name. There's just something about that face. There's just something about that love. There's just something about the one who can trust. As we look into the shining face of truth and compassion, we are going to have the opportunity to walk and talk with Jesus just like Adam and Eve because of the great plan of salvation that can only come through Jesus Christ. Now, we want to make this perfectly clear to the viewers that are watching today, and we probably throw this in every week. We'll make this perfectly clear. We are not saved by keeping the Ten Commandment law. We are saved by the resurrection and the death and the life and the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how we're saved. But because I am saved, automatically I want to please the Savior that I love, and I keep His Ten Commandment law. Is everybody with me? I don't keep them to be saved, but because I am saved, I keep the Ten Commandment law. You know what? Okay, I'm going to try to get through this. Here we go again, Doug. Jesus looks at me as if I'm one of his babies. Come on. I remember 31 years ago. Actually, Blake is going to be 32 years coming up here pretty soon. I remember the day that Blake was born like it was yesterday. Now, at that time, you could actually go into the delivery room. For a while, many, many years, you couldn't. But I went in there, and I remember the doctor had everything Brenda positioned perfectly. He said, can you see? I said, I can see, but I don't want to see. But I see. And I watched this football player be born. His shoulders were that wide, and you'll back me up on that, right? And he came out of there, and as he came out, Dr. Griffin handed Blake to me. And I carried him out of there. And instantly, at that moment, I love that boy. He didn't have to earn it. <laughs> he didn't have to buy it. I love that boy. And I carried him out, and we wrapped him in the blankets. And I'm carrying him to go get him weighed in. 20, 30 pounds, whatever he weighed. And I'm carrying him in there. And I get in there, and one of the nurses said, How's Brenda doing? I said, Brenda who? I was so enthralled and fascinated by this life that I was, and that I was a part of, right? I did a DNA, so I know I was. But I was a part of this life. Jesus Christ, when we were born, it's almost like Christ comes in to deliver him and packs us out. Come on, somebody. And that Jesus looks on each and every one of us, whether you be black or white or red or yellow, what color you are, it doesn't make Jesus any different. You're his baby. That relationship that I have with Blake even today, I'll have that relationship with my Father in heaven as well. Come on. That's what will happen if we remain faithful to Jesus. That's why today we wanted to cover several different things. You're either a seed of the devil or a seed of Christ. You either serve the devil or or you serve Christ today. Either you're saved, redeemed, born again, or you're lost today. Either you serve God, or you serve the devil today. But the number one thing we want to talk about today is your decisions will affect your life forever. Those that are viewing in today, you have the time, the opportunity. Today is the day of salvation. You have the opportunity right now as we speak to fall upon your knees and say, Oh God, Donnie says that all sin." And come short of the glory of God. He says that the wages of sin is death. 
But he also said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of life is only through Jesus Christ. Oh, God, wash me clean today in the blood of Jesus Christ. Wrap me with his righteousness. And, oh, God, give me the power of the Holy Spirit. And then guide me into all truth. Find yourself a Bible-based church today. God wants you in the kingdom just as once much as he wanted me. And whether you're into drugs or alcohol, no matter where you've been in the walk of life, the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse and make you perfect. And everybody said, amen. Perfect in his sight, wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. I beg of you today to make that decision. Tomorrow is not promised. Only now at this moment is promised unto you. Heavenly Father, I know, Father, this was a difficult sermon today, and I know it covered many, many different areas. We're just trying to bring to light the loveliness of Christ and His character. That when man sinned, God didn't say, oh, what are we going to do? He had a plan ready before the foundations of this planet. Maybe a trillion years before, I don't know. But a plan was made, and the Son of God would have to die that man would live. I praise you, Father, that you look upon us today not as a world or a people, but you look upon us as baby. You said, James, you're not a respecter of persons. It didn't matter if we're black or white, what denomination, what culture we live in today. You love us all the same with all your heart. And you died for each and every one of us. So, Father, today, I pray that you'll take this message, give some hope, give courage, give determination to those that are struggling in their walk with you today. I praise you, Father, for your grace and your love. I praise you for the Holy Spirit. Continue to guide us and direct us. And may our decisions, every decision that we make, be based upon your will of God. I praise you, Father, and I thank you. In the name of Christ, my best friend.